Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Magda Balazinska, I'm the director of the Allen School and I'm just so excited to uh, see you all here uh, today and then to have a chance to actually share lunch together after all this time where we were you know, separated by the pandemic. Uh, during this lunch, we have the honor of having a keynote speaker, and I'm very excited to be able to introduce her. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Professor Yejin Choi. Uh, Yejin is the Brett Helsel Professor uh, in the Allen School, but she also has a second appointment as a Senior Research Manager at AI2, overseeing the project, uh, project Mosaic. And this is really exciting. Several of our faculty members have this dual appointment with different organizations, but definitely a lot of work uh, between the AI2 and the Allen School and producing just really exciting papers and exciting research. But coming back to uh, Yejin, uh, her research investigates a wide variety of problems across natural language processing and AI, including common sense knowledge, reasoning, neural language generation or degeneration, language grounding with vision and experience, and also AI for social good. Yejin is our latest MacArthur Fellow, which is really exciting. This is it's called a genius grant. So it's really to recognize people who do exceptional, extraordinary work and give them the opportunity to continue to have free reign and innovate in their field. Uh, but that's not the only award that Yejin has. Uh, she has many other awards, including a NACL Best Paper Award just this year, an ICML Outstanding Paper Award, the ACL Test of Time Award, the CVPR Longet Higgins Prize, uh, the NURIPS Outstanding Paper Award, another AAAI Outstanding Paper Award, and I have to stop here because they told me I couldn't go on for 30 minutes, so. <laughs> I mean, overall, we're just so extremely proud uh, to have Yijin here as our colleague. We really feel fortunate, and her research is so exciting, and I'm really happy that she'll be able to share with you some of the work that she's doing. So well, join me in welcoming uh, Yijin. All right, um, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to share with you some strange research we've been doing in this theme of David versus Goliath, the art of leaderboarding in the era of extreme scale neural models. So extreme so that I get extreme questions from journalists. Are you sure we can't reach AGI just by scaling things up? GPT-3 is so magical. Uh, and the journalist wasn't going to uh, take no as my answer. Um, and then uh, folks in the academia, we worry, uh, or some of us worry, whether it's even possible to do impactful research without extreme scale compute. So let's draw some insight from all the literature. Uh, so according to the art of war, uh, we gotta know your en we gotta know our enemy, choose our battles, innovate your weapons. Uh, we have to reinterpret this in the modern deep learning uh, context, which means uh, evaluation with realism and scrutiny, uh, including adversarial or out of domain distribution examples, uh, choosing your battles through uh, interesting new task designs and leaderboards. Finally, the weapons are basically algorithms and data. So in this talk, I'm going to share some of our recent work of that nature. It's going to have a broadly two themes, the symbolic knowledge distillation and decoding algorithms, under which there are uh, a few different cases studies, but the recurring theme here will be that smaller can be better and knowledge is power. So let me start with the causal common sense models which starts with general language models in order to uh, draw causal common sense models. Why do we even care about common sense? Well, because despite human level or even superhuman level performances that we keep hearing about AI achieving, uh, the truth is when you give slightly different examples, like here you see an uh, alligator on the grass as captioned as a horse standing in the grass, Humans never make this kind of silly mistakes, but machines do do that because deep learning today knows how to solve basically a data set without really solving the underlying task, lacking systematic generalization. So why does this happen? Well, uh, basically the intuition is that humans really truly know, learn about how the world works. We have a true conceptual understanding of how the world works. So whereas machines, uh, they just learn some 
neural representation. Uh, God knows what's in there, but uh, it's some based on text and images and whatnot that it's not really a true understanding of how the world works. So in order to bridge this gap, uh, one of the important uh, questions we have to address is this challenge of common sense. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define it as the basic level of practical knowledge and reasoning concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared by most people. It's really important that we don't insist on what everyone agrees because that's not how the world works. The truth is we uh, rely on rules of thumb, such as it's okay to keep the closet door open, but it's not okay to keep the fridge door open because the food inside might go bad. So we kind of operate based on these sort of rules, but the truth is there can always be exceptions to this. So if the fridge is not connected to the wall, who cares whether you keep the door open or not? There can be many exceptional contexts in which this doesn't hold. And yet we do rely on these sort of rules in order to live and interact with each other in a reasonable and safe way. Therefore, AI needs to learn to uh, deal with human values and human basic knowledge about the world because they're being more integral part of our daily lives. So, the uh, sort of recurring uh, research themes um, in our group has been that language model is not identical to knowledge models, and we really have to uh, pursue knowledge model as the first class citizen of research goals. And uh, we study the symbolic common sense knowledge graph as well as a neural common sense model called atomic and the comet. And the symbolic common sense graph up until recently was fully crowdsourced. I highlight that because I'm gonna lift that limitation in this talk. But let me just um, mention that we had this uh, follow-up or Comet Atomic 2020. And let me show you some glimpse of what this symbolic knowledge graph looked like. So imagine you get your car repaired or X gets X's car repaired. And immediately, we can unroll a lot of common sense expectations about preconditions, the post conditions, what happens before and after. So afterwards, as a result, you might want to pay the bill or call uh, Lyft or Uber for a ride. And for that, you need money and mechanic. And that's sort of like event-centric knowledge we have in the atomic graph. We also have object-centric knowledge graph uh, for example, money can be used for paying repairs, but if you really want, you can also fold that into origami. I've never tried that, but it's a possible. And so there's something about this naive physics understanding about uh, object affordances as well as the stereotypical and non-stereotypical use cases. And then there are also other fun uh, things we can reason. For example, you cannot really get your car repaired if your car is totaled. So there are counterfactual situations in which this sort of um, event cannot happen. So in total, uh, we kept crowdsourcing on and on until we hit 1.3 million different if-then rules, or 1.3 million uh, rules of thumbs over 23 different edge types or relation types or inference types. So that's how things were up until 2020. Uh, things are different now, but let me uh, quickly highlight what kind of a usefulness does this sort of a knowledge graph provide. So here what you see is our small model comet compared to GPT-3, which is so large, it doesn't even fit into the slide. How large? It's more than 400 times larger than our model comet trained on this symbolic knowledge graph versus GPT-3, which is trained on just raw internet text. So how much of a common sense knowledge did the GPT-3 acquire? What you see here is accuracy judged by humans when the model makes uh, some common sense predictions described in natural language. So um, it's a generative evaluation. And GPT-3 says 73% compared to GPT-2, which used to be only 36%. So really remarkable jump there. But it's still not as good as Comet, which is so much easier and um, uh, smaller to uh, use. So um, turns out when you make some kind of uh, resource like Atomic at Comet available, people all around the world 
uh, do creative things. So uh, there are many uh, use cases that we didn't even envision, including storytelling in the fantasy games and st stuff like that. So we felt that we need to improve these resources. But we felt uh, crowdsourcing alone uh, is hitting the wall. So how about we uh, seek a different route? So here comes a symbolic knowledge distillation. The idea begins with this observation that this GPT-3, although not perfect, is very impressive. Can we somehow make it smaller but better? Uh, is that even possible, though? Because in machine learning literature, usually, I mean, especially these days, when you make something smaller, it doesn't work as well uh, in the context of deep learning. So um, this is going to be possible because our a technique called the symbolic knowledge distillation has this funnel that's literally convoluted with um, some stuff in the middle. And it builds on this original idea by Jeff Hinton and other co-authors called the knowledge distillation, where when you have a large teacher model that you want to compress it down to student model, it's a very simple idea. You want to optimize the cross entropy between the two models distribution over the output space. Um, great idea if your end goal is simply classification. Not as a uh, trivial idea to pursue when you have the output space that's open text, meaning there are exponentially many things that can be enumerated. But that's okay. Computer scientists, especially AI folks, we approximate things all the time by just sampling things and then call it a day. So we do do that, but the byproduct of it is this a symbolic knowledge graph because any text, interpret, uh, text output that the machine generate can be connected together into this graph structure. It turns out, um, compared to the original Atomic 2020, which was completely human authored, Atomic 10X, which is written by GPT-3, in terms of a quantity, what you see here, the height is a quantity in millions, with respect to only a subset of atomic types, there's like just causal common sense relation types, uh, only seven of them. Uh, so Atomic 2020 was fully crowdsourced, which meant it's expensive, and so we hit less than a million in quantity. Atomic 10X is much cheaper to generate, except that you see black portion, that's a bad portion. Because GPT-3 is only good at about 70% of the time. It, it knows something about common sense, but not very good. So what we did do is to have this critic model. It's a supervised small model, very easy to train on a moderate size annotation data that's easy to gather. And this critic also is not very good. It throws away a lot of good stuff, but it's able to throw away most of the black portion so that in the end, we still have a very large data set or uh, knowledge graph that's a higher quality than what humans ever wrote. So um, this is uh, usually what we don't expect to happen, by the way, because usually machine-generated knowledge shouldn't be as good as a human-generated one. But in this work, we demonstrate that actually, for the first time, we can demonstrate that AI can do better with some particular kinds of machine learning technique. So um, remember that the GPT-3 originally was only about 73% accuracy. It turns out if you teach from GPT-3 uh, to train a smaller model Comet, that alone already does better, but not as good as the Comet trained based on the original human data. But here, the surprising uh, ending of this uh, research is that when you use this filtered uh, GPT-3 or the more critical teacher that combines original GPT-3 with the small critic model, then through that collaboration, uh, it can teach the student better. It's almost like uh, collaboration generally is a good thing. Um, so that's what we found empirically. And in some, in conclusion, uh, we found a new way to generate symbolic common sense knowledge graph that's just better than what humans were able to write all around in terms of accuracy, scale, value, and even diversity. So we are very encouraged by this result. And, but some folks might not care about common sense reasoning. Maybe you care more about different types of a task, such as a summarization. So let me highlight very briefly uh, that it works for summarization as well. So this will be super quick. 
but it's a new work to appear at EMNOP. And I don't know if you have heard, but there's this new paper that basically says that GPT-3 is your best summarizer, better than any other supervised models, that the NLP community worked so hard for such a long time. So that's depressing. <laughs> or it's exciting if you, you know, try to do symbolic knowledge distillation. So let's grind this GPT-3 up so that we make a small model that's a better summarizer than GPT-3. And in fact, um, uh, the, the really uh, magic happens in this distillation funnel. So in this case, we can do something different. Uh, and it, in this work, we happen to have these uh, three kinds of filters. It's almost like a water filter. Good to have multi-layers, probably. So there's a fidelity filter that's based on natural language inference about whether there's a contradiction or not because summarization shouldn't be contradicting the original text. And then there's a length-based filter because the truth is GPT-3 doesn't summarize very much. It doesn't compress very much to be on the safe side. So maybe we want to be able to compress more, more flexibly. And then there's um, something called the information bottleneck filter if you happen to know about information bottleneck theory. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Um, but what happens is that in this work, we do this is the same symbolic knowledge distillation business as before to make GPT-3 smaller but better. But we found that you can actually keep iterating this for like how many times, seven times, um, to make things better and better and better. So um, the paper reports a lot more experiments, but the bottom line is that uh, it's exciting new result where we can actually have a smaller model that performs better than GPT-3. Um, let me be also super brief about yet another entirely different use case, such as natural language inference. If you're not familiar with this task, this is all about giving a two sentence, sentences as a pair to tell whether they are entailing each other, or one thing entails the other, or one thing contradicts the other. So it's all about some kind of a logical understanding of natural language uh, sentences. So for that, there's this famous data set called MNLI from Stanford, and this is basically the de facto data set to use to train your favorite neural language models so that it can test on a variety of different NLI benchmarks. It turns out uh, this is one of the unsolved problems with the deep learning. Uh, especially, a lot of people created the adversarial benchmarks. These are all adversarial benchmarks created by different people all around the world. And the performance should be 100%, but as you see, it's much lower than 100%. So this is where the state of the art is, which, of course, New York Times don't talk about because whatever it doesn't work, they don't talk about. Um, it turns out we can actually make data set distillation through this symbolic knowledge distillation style approach so that we have this new data set called Wangni that's smaller but better in terms of the out-of-domain performance it's better across the board. Of course, it's still very far from 100%, so a lot more work to be done, but this is exciting uh, first shot approach uh, result. So this is based on a notion that we developed as data set cartography, which is some kind of a statistical tool that you can use in order to map out your favorite data set into regions, easy to learn regions, ambiguous regions, hard to learn regions. So it turns out hard to learn is where model just cannot learn the correct label. Oftentimes, that's where the labeling noise or errors are. The ambiguous reason is are where the model just have a hard time learning. It flips back and forth. And it turns out this is a surprising empirical finding, which is that that ambiguous regions are not important for your in-domain performance, but important for your out-of-domain performance. And all we care is, in fact, out of a domain performance because the robustness is the recurring challenge with the current AI. So since we know that ambiguous regions are important, we might as well try to make more of them. And it turns out asking humans to do so can be tricky because humans tend to repeat themselves and then we do have some level of cognitive biases. So what we do here is we ask GPT-3 to write a lot of ambiguous examples. And then that uh, examples are not necessarily high quality. 
So we put filter in order to filter out potentially uh, less ambiguous ones or even incorrect ones uh, based on both the data set cartography as well as human validation. So the ending uh, data set is practically a new way of making a data set such that it's not just humans writing the data, but it's human AI collaboration. Okay, so finally, um, that's sort of like, um, I'm gonna skip the generic induction part, but that's sort of like different uh, case studies of a successful use of a symbolic knowledge distillation as a new framework of, of uh, learning particular kind of task-specific knowledge or common sense knowledge. Now, let me switch the gear to uh, tell you a little bit about decoding time algorithms. We developed quite a few, but today I'm going to just tell you about neural logic decoding. So this is the one that received the best paper award this year uh, called the Neural Logic A star ask which actually builds on our previous work, Neural Logic Decoding, in the previous year, NACO. In this talk, let me combine these two papers and then tell you a merged story. And the uh, key research vision is that although we hear a lot about how the scale does matter and there's a lot of emphasis on the importance of a scale, uh, the truth is algorithms do matter too which uh, mattered in the classical AI. And in fact, when we think about the success of original AlphaGo, Monte Carlo tree search was really important ingredient there. And so uh, here the idea is perhaps uh, algorithm is overlooked by the current trend about the overemphasis on the scale and Oftentimes when people use language model, they don't even really talk about which decoding algorithm because everyone is basically doing the same thing, which might be either beam search or might be some kind of a sampling or the even greedy decoding. But perhaps we can worry more about the role of the decoding algorithm because then uh, we might be able to, for example, inject logic constraints on the fly during decoding without having to retrain everything uh, all over. So logic constraints especially, we're gonna address the conjunctive normal forms that you may or may not remember anymore. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's a, it looks kind of fancy like this way. Doesn't matter, the detail doesn't matter all that much. But the key idea is that some of these NLP or NL natural language generation applications such as data to text generation or image captioning or even machine translation uh, does have a little bit of like this lexical constraints or logical constraints that you wish to incorporate during the generation. So that's what we want to better address. Now, uh, the fun part, uh, the neural logic decoding in a nutshell, is that this is some kind of a data set, uh, data structure, uh, like algorithms, and we kind of learned these sort of things a million years ago. Uh, so after drinking lots of coffee, we can do this again. I'm not gonna go into this detail right now though, we just ate lunch. So let's just say that uh, there's some data structure-like thing we can do. Um, the intuition about why this is not necessarily entirely trivial is because when you deal with conjunctive normal forms, uh, each clause that you want to satisfy can be either reversibly satisfied or irreversibly satisfied or reversibly unsatisfied and so forth. So these state changes which makes the implementation of algorithm a little bit trickier. But anywho, uh, what we can do is, um, um, we can do uh, the, the kind of a, a search we I just like summarized very quickly, and that alone, it turns out, is not enough because neurologic decoding in its vanilla form only worries about the past. It's not really able to look into the future. So. If your logic constraint is as simple as write a sentence with the three keywords, car, drive, snow, include them all. Uh, it's a very simple logic constraint and you can do this right away without having to see lots of uh, supervised uh, examples yourself. It's a very easy task. Machines today, usually you have to do supervised training over like 10,000s of examples and yet it still doesn't understand logic constraints. And so this is what we try to do through neural logic decoding. Um, anyhow, so when you generated I drive my car during the dot, 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 uh, you know that um, in order to deal with the snow 
later. It's better to pick winter as opposed to summer. Uh, it's such a trivial, forward-looking thing we can do that machines were not doing up until uh, we developed this neurologic A-star-esque. So it's based on this A-star search that um, I think a lot of us may have learned in the AI class, uh, believe it or not, it's a long time ago. But the A-star heuristic is basically the idea that we want to implement. It's hard to do that with a neural network, though. So that's why it's not properly A-star search, but A-star-esque. All right, so how the heuristic is done exactly, I don't think the implementation detail matters, so i just tell you that there are multiple ways to do that. We could do that based on greedy look-ahead, the BIM look-ahead, or it could be based on sampling look-ahead. We just explore different options, but basically it boils it down to just being a salt algorithm. So what can it do? So the empirical results were better than we expected. Um, here what you see, is on a data set called the common gen. This is where I give you some keywords to include. You generate reasonable sentence out, super easy for humans, hard for machines. So in terms of a coverage, which is satisfaction ratio, it's higher the better. Blue bar shows the supervised model such that X axis is the model size. So we see that the bigger the model, the better, the familiar story. But that's based on the uh, classical search algorithm. When you use neural logic, the performance just goes up right away, whether you use neural logic on top of a supervised model or unsupervised model. Not only that, uh, you see that um, in terms of rouge and meteor, which correspond to the quality of the text that generates, that that's generated, uh, we see that, again, the higher the better, Smaller model does better than larger model if powered with the neurologic decoding algorithm. Again, we don't see this kind of uh, results very often because uh, people tend to focus not algorithms but on scale itself, in which case, uh, well, you get the story that you expected to hear that the larger the better. But with the algorithm, we can do uh, a lot better. So we report um, uh, several different benchmarks, including constrained machine translation, and then text to, to, sorry, data to text generation, and content guided question generation, and so forth. So let me just wrap up that um, the premise of this talk actually, despite the fact that I was attacking large models, is that scaling laws are real, and denial is futile. Um, and, but, I think it's really, especially uh, when we think about the hard problems in AI, uh, we cannot just solve the hardest problems by scaling things up. Um, analogously to how you cannot reach to the moon by making the tallest building in the world one inch taller at a time. So scaling is, in my view, a necessary condition of AGI or AI in general, not the sufficient condition. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Okay, so there's that, and um, to summarize, in this talk, I presented symbolic knowledge distillation and decoding time algorithms, um, because language models are not knowledge models, neither knowledge models nor reasoning models. Um, in fact, humans do learn a great, uh, great deal of knowledge about how the world works from some sort of a declarative form of a text, uh, knowledge in text. And why should a machine and symbolic knowledge graph satisfy that needs? And smaller models can do better when powered with algorithms and data. Thank you. Thanks, Agent. Let me suggest that uh, questions should involve cornering the agent up front here because you have two minutes to get across the street for. <laughs> your next session. So please do join Ye Jin up here if you have more questions. Otherwise, back across the street for your next session. That was great. Thank you, sir.